This episode was made in support of the RCN Foundation. Every day, thousands of people rely on the care of nurses, midwives and healthcare professionals. The RCN Foundation gives vital support back to these caring professionals. The charity safeguards nurses in need, invests in nursing care and supports learning development for nursing staff. If you'd like to find out more, please visit rcnfoundation.org.uk. I'm a feminist, but today, when I shadowed nurses on a ward and one of them said, any questions? I asked, are your eyelashes real? (laughs) (laughs) And she said, no, is it that obvious? And I went, no, it's not. They just look really real. They look really real. She said, then why did you ask? I said, because I thought... On the off chance they're not, I want them. And we ended up having a long conversation about eyelashes and important NHS stuff too, and eyelashes. But also eyelashes. Mm -hmm. Um, When you say you shadowed a nurse, did they know you were going to be there or...? I find if you just walk into places with authority and then just start following people around, you've got to make yourself a little badge, something with the official logo of the institution. So if anyone is thinking about committing fraud, uh, <laughs> this Catch is the me place if you can. Me. I'm a feminist, but when David Bedil, who has been on here as a guest, uh, made a joke on Twitter about the new Doctor Who saying she'd spend the first day looking down her pants, I yelled at my computer... She'd be looking at her tits. It's tits. It's always tits. That's what we look at. That's what you look at. You, have an, you observe once. You have an observation of what's down your pants. And then the rest of the time, it's just tits. <laughs> and now I'm glad I didn't press send. It's a, it's a really good point. Yeah. But, like, honestly, how much time... Like, I am still fascinated by them. I think they are top shelf. <laughs> and you, you know, when you look at tits, you're like, mate... You, you're crushing it again. <laughs> Every day, you're showing up, you're doing your job, being fab. I love them. Your tits are very beautiful, though. Uh, thank I think, you. I think you've got thank exceptional you. breasts. That is very kind of you to I say think my lo- I really like my breasts. What would I don't... you change about yours? You sound reluctant. No, no, no. I personally wouldn't change anything about them. I think they're great, and I like the size and the shape mm. and the heft. <laughs> I was very flat-chested as a teenager, and even before that. And uh, (laughs) my best friend and I both were flat-chested in high school, and when we became best friends, as you do, there's a day, uh, where you're like, will you be my best friend? You're like, yeah, obviously. And then you never leave each other's side. And I told her that I was... I just as a bit of a joke. I said, oh, yeah, I was born with a concave chest. And made a joke about it, never thought about it again. It was the 90s. Who knew? And then later, I didn't get boobs till I was about 17, like full score. It was just the best. Like over summer, I just went, Poof. I'm like, thank you if there is a God. It was so ace. It was so ace. And we'd gone to separate A-level schools and we met up and she went, what happened? I went, I got teeth. And she said, I thought that you were born with a concave chest. <laughs> and I was like, I told you that as a joke. Five years ago. Oh. And she was like, that's all we had. I'm a feminist. But when I had a really moving photo with some nurses today on the ward that I'd shadowed, and they told me how important the podcast was to them, and I told them how important their work was to me, and we all had this moment together, and I looked at the photo. <laughs> I was like... I look really slim in that. Oh, I'm so and glad that's the way you went. Yeah, that's it made great. my day. I was like, can you send that to me? And she went, yeah, yeah, yeah I will. And I was like, no, but now. Because it's the thinnest I'd looked at a photo for years. And I was just like, you will though, won't you? And she was like, well, how will I get it to you? And I was like, friend me on Facebook. <laughs> Do it, I'm a feminist butt. I'm a feminist butt. I still refer to knee-high boots as fuck me boots. <laughs> What do you call them? Do you call them... Oh, you would say knee-high boots, wouldn't you? I don't really wear knee-high boots. I mean, I, I've got boots, but I just call them boots. You don't say, like, oh, it's just an ankle boot. Like, just to sound cute. I might do. It's not... A, it doesn't take up a lot of my day, I'll be honest. <laughs> it's, it's All right, a... my days are a little more free than yours. <laughs> oh. I'm a feminist, but later on, when we have a little auction for the fundraising for the Royal College of Nurses, the thing I'm most excited about auctioning <laughs> is a vintage makeover day done in Essex by a famous nurse off Holtby City. (laughs) She's going to do victory rolls in your hair and a full vintage makeover and you get a dress and they're going to take pictures of you and it's going to be... uh, I'm going to bid on it. 
<laughs> I want it. I'm a feminist, but when I was watching The People vs. O.J. Simpson on Netflix, the main prosecutor's hairstyle was being ridiculed by the American media and the public and the defence, and my first thought was, yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> and then I remembered what she was working for, and I donated to a business that provides free legal counsel. <laughs> Live from the Royal College of Nursing, <laughs> A&E nurse, Helen Ormrod, community staff nurse, Charlotte Mead, and our CN chief negotiator, Josie Irwell. <laughs> this is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Mine them. I love the way you say that every time. It's Mine become them. more and more, it's become more and more mannered as I've gone on. So, uh, Felicity Ward, even your name sounds like the NHS. Oh, I know. F, F Ward. As I live and breathe. F Ward. We are facing a difficult time now for the NHS. Um, I mean, you say now, I feel like it's gently being water tortured for the last oh, sure, decade sure. or so. But it feels like more of an emergency now, which is why we're having an emergency episode for the nurses. Indeed. I'm very excited about it. I'm not excited about the emergency. <laughs> I just love no. watching you guys struggle. No. I know it's sick, but it's fun to watch. No, no. I'm joking. Uh, like, so we have something called Medicare in Australia, which is similar. And it used to be that most GPs were... Uh, let me prefix this by saying I'm not a doctor um, or a nurse or anyone that has been involved in policy. So if I make a mistake, I truly apologise. My understanding is in Australia, when I was growing up anyway, all doctors bulk billed. And what that meant was you got it for free, that you went and saw it for free. And then slowly there was privatisation. You still can see doctors. You can still get bulk billed. But my experience of trying to find them were quite difficult when I lived in inner cities. But when I came over here in 19... Uh, Oh, she was... No, it was 2007 I came over here and I lost a decade. I was drinking then. <laughs> and uh, I came over in 2007 and um, I was on the pill. I know, what a slut. And um, I don't mind. And anyway, I ended up staying over here longer than I expected and I met someone and I needed to go and get a pill prescription. And so I went to a sexual health clinic, I think, and I caught the bus. I was very proud of myself. And I got there and then she asked me about, do you have migraines? And I said, yes. And she's like, well, you can't have this kind of pill. I'm like, what? Anyway, we had a long chat, me and the nurse. And then afterwards she said, take the prescription to the front counter and you can get your pill. And I went, okay, cool. And I went around there and I showed the prescription. I waited. She gave me the pill and I just had my credit card out and she was looking at me and I was looking at her and I thought, is she having a breakdown? And <laughs> she was looking at me like, is she going to hold me up? <laughs> and I said, oh, I, I just went and saw the nurse. And she went, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, but um, uh, she, uh, she gave me the prescription for the, the pill. She goes, yeah, and there they are. I'm like, yeah, I've just got to pay for it. And she goes, no, you don't pay. I'm like, I don't think I've explained myself properly. I, I saw a nurse and you're, I got drugs. She's like, yeah. And she's like, it's free. I'm like, I don't understand what is happening here. I'm a visitor to your country. Yeah. I wasn't living here then. I was just a dirty, dirty backpacker fucking one of your dudes. <laughs> To, what I wanted to do was segue to a story about my mother, and mm. now I feel I can't because I don't want to sully her Were you by also attaching fucking her. Your no, no. Really? <laughs> I no. My mother uh, had a fall while she was here, and she's from Australia, and the care was incredible. And because we have a reciprocal relationship with Australia. Well, she didn't pay anything. And it's same as if you were in Australia. What's bizarre about Australia is they're paying Australians to have more children because the population's too small. What is this, Nazi Germany? And at the same time, borders up. So let's... It is Nazi Germany. <laughs> um, so we should do our challenges with economy. Oh, my God. So could you please do your challenges? Oh, my God. Okay. Your challenge? I mean, I don't know how we're going to do this with economy. Um, well, so we have to because then we've got to get the nurses on because this uh, is their show. Who wants to hear from nurses? <laughs> In a very real Sorry. way, that is the point of the show for this okay. So crack it along. Okay. I am going to start. With, so what I did as my challenge, Deb, is I did a shout out to people and said, do you have any stories about heroic nurses? So what I thought I'd do was I would just read out their stories sort of as a little bit of a thank you to the nurses in the room and to let the listeners know all the wonderful things that they do. I'll leave them all anonymous so no one gets embarrassed just in case. So 
Uh, this one is, my uncle was knocked off his bike and was on life support. I mean, I'm going to cry this whole thing. My uncle was knocked off his bike and was on life support in the intensive care ward for three weeks. The nurses who looked after him were incredible. After the third week, we came to understand that he wasn't going to pull through and we prepared ourselves for the inevitable final action. The thing that most people don't know is it's not an immediate thing. The body is an incredible machine and once all mechanical support had been removed, my uncle, being the ox of a man that he was, took his own sweet time to leave us. It took hours. The nurse who was with us that night had also been there for the three weeks looking after my uncle. My uncle was an organ donor so he had to wait it out on this small antechamber room on the other side of the surgery. The nurse we had stayed with us for the entire time. He'd done a 12-hour night shift and was ending it with us. A new nurse came in to relieve him from the end of his shift about halfway through our time, but he politely said to the new nurse that he would be staying with us until the end. I can't imagine how tired he must have been. It was the night shift and we'd been at the hospital since the early hours. But those few extra hours having him with us meant more than I can ever explain. It's those heroic acts of kindness that mean everything. I have definitely a heroic nurse experience. When my son was eight months old, he had bron- bronchiolitis? Bronchitis? No, it's bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis. Thank you, nurses. <laughs> Sorry. Is it bronchitis, Felicity, is that you can't read again? <laughs> what um, happened with the bronchiolitis? Well, <laughs> Uh, He had bronchiolitis and was in hospital for four days. It was a scary time. We hadn't slept all night due to him coughing and wheezing. The next morning, I got an emergency GP appointment first thing. We left the GP in an ambulance after he suddenly worsened while we were there. After two nights in hospital and three with no sleep at all on top of usual non-sleeping baby exhaustion, I stood at the side of his cot weeping in desperation after my husband had been sent home. My son cried and cried and wouldn't sleep and I'd tried everything. I was still breastfeeding, though not exclusively by then, so I felt it had to be me who stayed. A nurse called Laura came in and asked me if I was okay. I told her I was just so incredibly tired and didn't have anything left to give that I felt guilty and sad and didn't know what to do. She held my son, showed me to a bed and told me to sleep. I was too drained to protest much. I slept for five blissful, precious hours and I woke up a new woman. She'd given him a bottle, after which he went to sleep for several hours and I came back to find him quite contented but awake and ready for a feed with me. I survived the experience thanks to her kindness and I've never forgotten it. Laura, if you're listening, Laura, at this particular hospital, you are my hero. My daughter was in the same ward recently but thankfully briefly and I wept again remembering the amazing thing that she had done. stand up now because I did a job swap but Felicity Ward does. This is (laughs) bullshit. Please welcome to the stage Felicity Ward. Usually Deb gets up here every week and she writes stand up for that particular topic and what I usually do is go back to the archives and go where's something I can dust off Um, and then this week what I've done is I've tried to follow in Deb's footsteps I've written a short bit of it the rest of it I'm just going to busk but I wanted to tell you you might not know this actually none of you will know this that I spent a lot of time in hospital as a teenager I remember over a six month period between ages of 14 and 15 I had to make seven or eight visits to the hospital and two or three of those were overnight I wasn't sick Uh, it was far worse I was clumsy (laughs) which in many ways is worse because there's no cure and I broke my right arm three times both bones every time like straight out of the classic handbook for dickheads and you should feel sorry for me none of these times and so uh, the first time I did it I was playing hide and go seek and it's like hide and seek with the added thrill of a full body tackle at the end of it (laughs) And we were unsupervised because it was the 80s. You didn't need supervision. We were babysat by the sun in the 80s. Basically, if you were home by dark, then it was fine. That was enough. The sun would look after you because, as we all know, nothing bad happens in the day. (laughs) Fortunately, since the 80s, in many areas, there's been some studies to disprove that theory. (laughs) 
um, so it was sometime between, let's say, 6.30am and 8.30pm <laughs> and that's all that mum and dad needed to know and I was playing hide and go seek with some friends and my sister and at my friend's house there were two sisters too. One was in my year and one was in my sister's year and that was the only time that my sister would play with me is that if there was someone that was her age or under duress. That's the only time an older sister will... Poor older sisters, mate. They have to drag around a slower, lamer, younger version of themselves. Whether they want to or not, they watch their younger sister waltz into events years before they were allowed to. Years that they toiled and worked and begged. And then someone younger comes across and goes, I'd like to do that too. And mum goes, oh, well, you can take your sister, can you? I mean, you poor, poor bastards. So we're playing hide and go seek at my friend's house. This is where the story just goes into its own. So um, we're playing hide and go seek and I ran up a set of stairs that were like a little porch. They were very short, but so was I. And I got around. I'd been sought and then I was being chased and I was just about to jump off this very short set of stairs and I looked around just to see how far behind my sister was and she was delighted about touching me. I mean, like (laughs) punching, because that's the great thing about hide and go seek. You're like, what? I was just tagging you. Like, why do I have a hand mark on my face? (laughs) And so I turned around and she went, rah! And I fell off the side of the banister and fell onto my arm and got a green stick fracture. I didn't know that at the time. And I was just sort of lying there going, ow, ow. And then, up to this day, I don't know who it was, a man just appeared. Just a man and went, I'll carry you home down the street. I'm like, cool, stranger. Thanks, man. As I said, it was the 80s. Men in the 80s didn't do bad things to children, as we know, and we found out. Anyway, so he scooped me up in his arms and he walked me home and carried me home and said, oh, I think she's broken her arm. I think he said this. I might be making it up. And mum's like, yeah, all right. She's like, don't be a whinger, Felicity. I'm like, yeah, okay, I won't be a whinger. And then about an hour later, I'm like, oh, mum, it's still pretty sore. She's like, yeah, yeah, we'll get you to the hospital. God, you go on, don't you? And... (laughs) Took me to the hospital and it was a green stick fracture. I had my arm in a cast for, I think, six weeks. Oh, my God. Nobody tells you about the smell when you take it off. (laughs) Oh, nobody tells you about the smell. You're like, I'm so excited about seeing my arm again. Like, you've missed it. Like, it's a pen pal. And then the cast comes off. You're like, ah! Why is that 10 kilos lighter than the rest of my body? And why is it brown and why does it stink? It's so disgusting. It's so disgusting. So that was the first time. And I was actually nine when that happened. And then when I was 14, I was trying to impress a boy. (laughs) All the girls were wearing short skirts and makeup and like playing with their hair. And that seemed to be working. I'm like, seems too easy for me. (laughs) So what I'm going to do is be just as competitive as the boys try and beat them at their own game and then rub it in their face. (laughs) And I thought, I am going to be rolling in dick. (laughs) I'm going to be elbow deep in nuts. And I never thought that. I um, I thought, hope I'm like, maybe one of them will kiss me. (laughs) No. Um, So there was a boy, his name was Wade Davis. Hi, Wade, if you're asking, thank you for being so kind for the, I'd say, seven times that I asked you out and you said no. And... (laughs) Uh, he is, so we were, it was a rainy day and it was sports day so they just put you in a classroom again completely unsupervised they're like get you in a couple of hours like thanks grammar school and so he did the thing where you step on a seat and you put one foot on the base of the seat and then one foot on the back of the seat and then you walk forward and you push it slowly and I was like <laughs> I could do that and then I did it, nailed it, obviously. And then he got up and went, yeah, well, I can do it backwards. And he put one foot on the seat and one foot on the back. And then he did it backwards and he sort of did a wobble. I'm like, oh, pussy. And then, because you can show no fear. And, <laughs> and I thought, I can do that too. And then I did it. I was like, oh, Wade is totally going to ask me out after I do this chair trick. <laughs> Nerds, if you're listening, it doesn't work. It doesn't <laughs> work I came down and I snapped my arm on the base of the chair and got like the heartbeat and I looked down and I'm like well that isn't the way it's supposed to be 
And then I was just sort of in shock and they carried me down the stairs. They walked me down like, what's going on? Why do I feel like I'm going to vomit and fall down at the same time? And then the nurse gave me some gas and we were across the road from the hospital, but they still had to send the ambulance. And I remember like walking out in front of the school. We went to a big school. There was like 1,200 kids. And you kids are such dickheads. I was walking down. I'd like been gassed up and someone was carrying my backpack and I was sweaty because I was a teenager and I stank. You all do. I'm sorry if you're listening. You stink age 14 to 19. There's nothing you can do about it. And I was walking along in a daze and all these people were hanging out the window going, oh, oh, you're a dickhead. Oh, you're a coordinator. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a dickhead. Yeah, okay. Thank- Peace, man. And they put me in an ambulance and I had that cast on for about four weeks and then I got an x-ray and it had slipped again and so they had to reset it again and that was where I discovered pethidine. Ooh, Nelly. <laughs> I remember being 14 and mum coming in after they'd reset my arm. She goes, how are you, darling? I'm like, I don't know. But if I ever become a drug addict, this is going to be the one. <laughs> Delicious. So... So my arm came out of the cast just in time for summer and so I could swim and uh, obviously it was looking beach ready, my arm. (laughs) And six months later, I was in a musical at the Laycock Street Theatre, Gosford Musical Society, Clang, if you're listening. And uh, we were pretty big and uh, I had been cast as Bette in the musical Oliver. I know, I didn't know it was a part either and I was still happy to get it. And we were halfway through the rehearsals and we had a break... And so we were doing what kids do, which is showing off. And I said to everyone, I can do a round off. Big brag back in the 90s, big brag. If you don't know what a round off is, it's like a double handed cartwheel that you run up, you press off at the same time, then you land. You're like, yeah, that's right. I could have been in the Olympics, but I chose to be here. (laughs) So I go to do a run off and there's a guy that I've totally got a crush on. It's a recurring theme for most of my life. And... (laughs) I run up and he does the thing where he puts his foot out and puts his scare hands out and does like a little boot. And I catch him and myself and I stop before I do that. Ran off, I said, no, don't do that because something bad will happen. He's like, okay. So I line myself up again. (laughs) Ready, ready. Like, oh my God, I just thought I was a gymnast. And this is a little side note. I don't know if you're the same as this. Everyone goes, oh, I'll probably be shit at that. I won't do it. Or people don't think that. I have the opposite where I (laughs) I think... Oh my God, what if I've been like waiting to do this my whole (laughs) life? (laughs) Like anything I try my hand out, they're gonna go, how come NASA hasn't contacted you? (laughs) You're a genius. Like I'll try stilt walking or something and just be like, quick, get Cirque du Soleil on the phone. She's a genius, anything like computers. I'm like, I probably got this. You're like, oh, you've broken it forever. So I'm doing a handstand because I could probably be a gymnast because I'm probably a genius at it. And I run up, put my hands down again, and he does a little half one. And I look up and I hear, click. And then I look down and it's happened again. And it's six months later. And the first thing I say is, oh, mum's going to kill me. And then there's this guy, his name's Ian, his nickname is Mouse. Hello if you're listening. I grew up in a small town. And he, he's in the cast and he comes over and goes, oh, you've broken your arm, like, you're a genius. Uh, and then he goes, I'm just going to straighten it out for you. And I'm like, just because we're doing the play Oliver doesn't mean we don't have modern medicine. Wait until the professionals get here. And so the ambulance turned up, I think, and then they drove me there and then I had to have the cast on again and then it slipped again. I know, while I was in the cast. And so I ended up having the cast on for 12 weeks and I'm like an old lady. I've been like an old lady since I was 15. If we're getting inclement weather, I'm like, no, bones are going. I think we've got a storm coming on, a bit of humidity in the air. That's my story. Can I tell you one? I forgot yep. to tell you this. Mm. So the broken arm thing was two weeks before the musical. And I had to do the whole musical with a broken arm. So I was like the only street rat with health care. <laughs> like I was in my little velvet jacket and uh, my little scraggly dress, but a little cast underneath yeah, that. Yeah, like anyone cared enough about an orphan to give exactly. them a cast in Victorian times. 
That reminds me of Nigel Havers. <gasps> I have no idea who you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> posh English actor, when he's a young man, got a part in Chariots of Fire, which was a huge big deal. Mm. And when he was practicing, because it's a film about running, and he was playing a hurdler, he was practicing hurdling. <laughs> he fell and broke his arm, and he couldn't tell anyone because if it had to have a cast, he'd get dropped from the movie. So he just sort of pushed it back in a bit. Oh. <gasps> And sort of secretly strapped it up under his clothes and then just kept on. And he showed it on Parkinson or something. And his arm is permanently <gasps> odd because he ran through the pain. And can you imagine hurdling while acting happy? Because the whole point of Lord Lindsay, the part he was playing, was that what motivates him is just the sheer joy. Mm. And so every time mm. he has to jump a hurdle, his face had to go... <gasps> Watch the movie. He still said like this thrill on his face. And there's one scene where he, because he's very posh, he puts champagne glasses, sort of like those old fashioned like martini glasses, on the hurdles, and he jumps over the champagne and says to his butler, "Touch but not spill." Oh, I'm and glad so I've never seen this movie. It sounds horrific. Oh no, it's 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 amazing. It's amazing. It's about what makes people run. He's the posh one. The other two are running with different motivation. But it's yeah, no, I, I don't love it still. No, I'm going to make you watch it. It's oh. one of my favourite movies in the world. Okay. Oh god, I don't want to watch it at all. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's not a choice at this does point. It, I mean, oh, God, yeah, I want to see a posh man do well at athletics because he's been given nothing else in his life. That's... <laughs> no. That's, the, that's not the point of the movie. He's one man. The other one it's is... It's the system. <laughs> no, one of them is Jewish and there's a lot of anti-Semitism and it's really about him. It's about racism, that movie, and you've just mocked it. How it's, do you feel now? <laughs> you mean racism in both the senses of the word? Oh. R-A-C-E-I-S-M. It's good. Strong, strong work. Thank strong you. word play there from Felicity Ward. Thank you. My challenge was to go and shadow nurses in a hospital. And I was really, really blown away by what I saw there. I really learned a lot, actually. I really realised, because every other time I've been in a hospital, it's because I've not been well or someone I've loved has not been well. And then you're in a heightened state and you're very focused on that. So just to go in and look at it objectively and see the mechanics and spend a few hours there was amazing. And I really realised that while the doctors will come in and consult and they'll make decisions, it's the nurses that are there all the time, often making hard calls, being the eyes and ears, noticing that's not quite right, that's a bit different from normal, and just being really alert and carrying everything out, carrying out all the technical stuff. It's extraordinary. I worked with someone called Tasha who was in intensive care outreach. So she goes around the hospital, she gets bleeped where they need somebody because something's gone wrong and something's become more critical. And so she goes there and often takes that person to intensive care or diagnoses whatever the situation is there. And we were first on the neuro high dependency ward, people with brain problems, neuro... neuro um, Bronchiolitis. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then we went to the critical care unit. We we're on number three, which is apparently the highest level of care, and saw some people there who were really, really, really ill. And watching these nurses, in that part of the hospital, there's one patient to one nurse. And when you see, objectively, just watching somebody else's family, the mother, the husband, the children, the wife, with that person, the person they love most in the world, and you see the way that the nurses so warmly and kindly and calmly help the family, are there for the family, deal with the family, and deal with the patient. I mean, it is an extraordinary thing to see. And you just think, God, if that were me or my family, having those women there, and they are mostly women, to attend and to know and to be courageous on your behalf when you feel that you can't. And I went to various wards and I interviewed quite a lot of different nurses and asked them what made them want to be nurses. And one of them said to me, Liv, her name was Liv, she said, because my best day is better than any anyone else's best day she said you know I can save somebody's life and my friends who are doing other jobs office jobs and things you know they'll say I had a really tough day today or I had a really brilliant day and I think no you didn't she said my worst day is worse than any worst day you've ever had and my best day is best than any best day you've had on the job and they were saying that sometimes they'll be on the bus home and they'll get a text from a doctor saying he made it you know and it's just they were just sort of saying like you know they'll sit on the bus crying and mm. like I'll you know it was just really amazing like I guess they've just better than other people yeah like it just I just they it's just like whatever the bit of you that makes you human and good you know the part of you that you can access that makes you at those times just not selfish just to be good you know sometimes you see someone you think do you know what I'm going to stop and help that lady with a pram off the tube I'm going to ring that friend who I don't really want to ring because I know they're having a really tough time and I don't know what to say but I'm going to ring them 
whatever that bit in human beings is, they've just got extra of it. That's the only way I can describe it. Because I was asking them and, and Liv was saying, I just love cleaning people. She said, I really, really, that's my favourite part of the job. I mean, we are different. She said, we are very... <laughs> I don't even like cleaning myself. No, no. She said, I just love it when all my patients look really shiny and I know that they feel... Is she talking about a car or people? No. That's definitely... She you said that when they... you're buffing someone, exactly. you put a wax polish on. But genuinely, that's what she was saying. She said, like, I don't like it if people look messy. And it was something about giving that person dignity. And there was an old man on the ward and I saw Tasha just lean in and say, do you need anything? She could just see he was just looking a bit lonely and a bit lost. And he whispered something to her and she said, all right, all right. And then she went over to the other nurse and she said could he have a shave? And she went back and she said, I'll definitely get this for you. If not now, by the end of the shift tonight, someone's going to shave you. And he was like, thanks very much. And you could just see those little bits of care. This poor old man's lying there in a hospital robe. He hasn't got his own clothes. He's really ill. He didn't have anyone with him. Mm. That little act of being shaved and making mm. him feel dignified. Because mm. uh, he wasn't always an old man. He was a young, vital man who you know, was rushing around doing things himself. He just wanted to feel normal and human. And she spotted it, leaned in, asked him, what is the thing you want? It's like nurses have their own version of gaydar, but for goodness. Yes. <laughs> so they're like, I feel like someone is wanting. Hang on. Yeah, that's right. And someone needs a polishing. Hang on. It's, that's right. I've got to wax someone. That's exactly right. I don't think it's Brazilian waxes. I think, no. No, it's not that. And Although then, she can be very shiny after a wax. It's true. There was another nurse, Louisa, and she said, I love science. I love the human body. I love solving mysteries. She sounded like house. Um, <laughs> she, I love knowing how it works. And so lots of people gave me different answers. Somebody said she'd cared for her grandmother when she was younger and she knew that she loved caring. Mm. But that they all got on so well. They were so nice to each other. And they said, oh, it's not like that everywhere. But it is here. We are really nice to each other. I we bet get you they all say that, though. It's like, oh, yeah, we're better than other places, actually. Uh, well, maybe. But maybe that's a sort of pride in your local area as well. But they said that lots of wards have the big five or the big three it's like whatever they think might have been being overlooked so today our big three is we're going to just be really vigilant about washing hands like have you you know it's just a reminder and then the next day it'll be something else we're going to be really careful about checking the fluids and we're going to be really vigilant about asking our patients if there's anything we can do and then the next day they change it just so that it reminds them to do things that might otherwise fall away because they're very understaffed and I found it really moving because they said that the other day on the big three was listen to the Guilty Feminist podcast oh. I know I found it really moving and some of the nurses came out and they were like oh my god it's you it's you and they just said how much the podcast had helped them what? feel like they could take up space in the world and ask for what they needed and that nurses are often made to feel a bit extra or, you know, yeah, you're there to facilitate, you're there to help. Mm. You don't get to ask for anything. We ask you for things. Mm. And they said that it really helped them. One nurse said, sometimes I feel like I don't have time for my friends anymore because she works a lot of extra shifts and it's very understaffed. And she said, I get so tired on my days off and I try and go out to see people because otherwise, you know, I'll end up as a hermit. But she said, sometimes I just have to sleep. And she said, listening to the podcast makes me feel like I have friends, you know. And oh I just, my God. I know, it just. Whoa. And, Whoa. Nurses, if you're listening, we are your friends. I know, I know, I know. I, then I said, let's go out for drinks. And we were like, we became like buddies. We're going drinking. Because I was just like, that is... Because that's what really, nurses do. I felt really... <laughs> they do. Nurses love a piss up. They love it. <laughs> they love it. Oh, God, they bloody deserve it. Filthy um, booze hounds. <laughs> And the other thing that Tasha said to me, I was asking her why well, she was a nurse, and she said, for me, the big thrill is the quality of care. Because I was saying, is it sort of saving people, like saving lives? And she said, it is, but she said, it's not just about saving lives. It's good care. And she said, sometimes that means a good death. She said, because we've all got to die. And she said, but I can help people die. I can give them a good death. That they, She said that they're there. They're not in pain. They feel loved. They feel looked after. And they're with their friends and family. Or if they don't have anyone, they're with me. And I just thought, oh, God, you know, because I, I just... I just thought, who are these saintly people who are doing this? And it, I could see that that's, she really meant that. And the fact that mm. the women that were giving me these answers today, and I know some men too who are nurses, they're not asking for extra. They're asking for a living wage. And the big thing that they said that they all wanted was enough staff that they could do their job. Because they said when they can't shave the man who wants to be shaved, oh. it's when they can't give someone a good death. Because they're just, someone over here 
is about to die too and they can save this person they can't save this one they said that's when they burn out because they haven't got the resources to do the job that they want to do well and they come home and they feel like they've lost their soul they're incredibly exhausted they're just about on a living wage some of them in London aren't on a living wage and they're going to food banks and they can't do the thing that they love about the job which is looking after people and they said sometimes people say why are you not a doctor and they're like because I don't want to be a doctor, it's a different job. And part of this job and your vocation for nursing is being able to look after people. And if they don't have time to look after people just to sort of plug things in and run on and give medicine and be on your way, then it's not the job. Mm. So if they don't have the funds, they said that people aren't going into nursing anymore because it's not the same job anymore because there's just not the time in all cases to do the job and that's getting worse and worse. And that's why we really, really, really need to support the nurses the way we supported the junior doctors. And we really, really need to help them now because you know I don't have any kids I mean you Tom me I do but it's highly possible Felicity you'll be dead by the time that I'm dying so <laughs> or back in Australia I don't know I'm not why are I just, we talking about my death just saying I don't have any kids and I, Tom who's the producer he's my husband but men don't live as long as women let's be clear so <laughs> I could easily be in that hospital on my own dying and at that point no I was thinking about it I was looking at old people going going you know I want to be able to die well and these nurses are extremely Mm. good human beings who Mm. want to facilitate that for people and we have to allow them to do that because the NHS is the most precious thing we've got and the nurses seem to me now from the day that I had to be the most precious part of the NHS Mm. I agree I agree I should okay. say that my auntie is a nurse and I can't wait to play this for oh. her. And she is a booze hound too. She <laughs> is made. Hello, Bacon. Flix auntie. Hi, Jen. Hi, Auntie Jen. This week, my challenge was to do a job swap. And the swap that I arranged is that I've given my stand-up slot to a nurse. Um, so I would like to introduce someone to the microphone who is a spoken word artist, writer and nurse, born and brought up in South London. She's currently working at a hospital in London and she's performed her poetry across Europe. Please welcome to the stage, Molly Case. Thank you very much. In that. That's lovely. I just wanted to say two things, I think. Firstly, I feel very at home here, so thank you very much for having me here this evening to speak on the podcast. I'm a big fan. I discovered you in Hobbycraft. I don't know if you have that in Australia. Hobbycraft? Decoupage and craft? Um, I've lived here for four years. I know a bit. No, I, I'm not crafty, but I'm planning a wedding, so I had to go crafty. Um, this is planning a wedding too. Mine is next week. Mine's in September. How are you yes. going? How are you? I'm anxious. Anxious, yeah. Mildly anxious, but happy. Yeah, that's the correct response. It's yeah. a very stressful experience. I feel like we can just go. <laughs> Congratulations. And to you too. Thank you. I'm going to perform just one poem for you this evening and just to give you a little bit of information as to who I am. I am a nurse. I work in South London in a hospital. <laughs> Repping. And I'm also a poet. And a little bit of background about this poem. When I was doing my nurse training... The times were bad. It was a really difficult time to be training to be a nurse and for different reasons, not how it is now at all. The press and the public perceived us really, really badly. Um, It was in the wake of some awful care that had been discovered. And I wrote this poem as a knee-jerk response to being portrayed really, really badly. And I think it's really interesting to perform this poem now in 2017 when I really feel like the public are in support of us and that's a wonderful thing because having a community with nurses and with the public is super and now it's the government that's against us and that's really tricky because they're a monolithic thing. Anyway, so I'm going to perform a poem about how much I love my profession and I'm grateful to all of you guys who are nursing and who are supportive of us as nurses and it's called Nursing the Nation. A woman comes in, too young to bear this, She's got a disease that will make her miss her daughter's wedding day, her first grandchild being born. How would that feel to have all that torn away from you? I can't answer that question. It's not my place to say, but I can tell you what we did for her, how we helped to get through the day. 
A cup of tea there and one for all her family. As they came throughout the night, what a sight there were loads of them. To help her fight the awful pain of it, paying last visits, we wouldn't let them miss it. Farewell from a brother, last kisses with their mother, holiest love, love like no other. Maybe there's bad ones, no doubt that there are. But for this list I'm writing, we don't want the same tar brush crushing our careers before they've even started. How could you say this about people so big hearted? Who would have thought we'd be having to defend? We don't do this for our families, we don't do this for our friends, but for strangers. Because this is our vocation, and we're sick and tired of being told we don't do enough for this nation. So listen to us. Hear us goddamn roar. You say we're not doing enough, then we promise we'll do more. This time, next time, there's nothing we can't handle. Even if you bring us down, show us scandal, scandal, scandal. You remember that man, covered in burns, head to toe. I don't think you do, because you're on that TV show. Lip gloss kissed women on daytime TV. Come into our world, see things that we see. One lady, passing, had no relative to stay. We sang her to sleep, let angels carry her away. Were you there that day when we held her hand, told her nothing would harm her, that there was a higher plan, saw her face as she remembered a faith she'd once held, watched her breath in the room as she finally exhaled? Why don't you meet us? Come, shake our hands, try to fit it in between having tea with your fans. Your hands are so soft and mine are cracked. Why don't you let us on air, let us air the facts? We've washed and shrouded people that we've never known, pinned flowers to the sheets and told them they're still not alone, shown families to the faith room and watched them mourn their dead, then got back to work, bathed patients, made beds. Hindus, Muslims, Jews and Sikhs, Buddhists and Christians and just people off the street. We've cared for them all and we love what we do. We don't want a medal. We just want to show you. So listen to us. Hear us goddamn roar. You say we're not doing enough, then we promise we'll do more. Thank you. It's Deborah from The Guilty Feminist, briefly interrupting The Guilty Feminist. To say that the Sydney show on the 21st of October has sold out, so we have added another date. You can now get tickets for the 19th of October. If you'd like to get one of those, go to giantdwarf.com.au. Please look out for more tour dates in Australia and New Zealand in October, November this year. If you'd like to support the podcast, we don't ask for donations, but we do have one very special episode about negotiating in which Athena Cableno and I interview expert hostage negotiator Suzanne Williams. If you buy the negotiation special episode of The Guilty Feminist in the month of August, the profits will go directly to the RCN to support the nurses. It costs £5 and is available globally. If you buy it in September or from then on, the proceeds will go to making more Guilty Feminist events more affordable for more women and to support the podcast. Please go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on Negotiation Special. Here's a clip from that special episode, available to buy only. And how do people find you? Because I didn't know that this existed just as a job. If somebody needed your services, how would they find out about you and how to ask for your help? If you need me, you can find me. Oh. oh, I love you so much. She's like a superhero. So like could Batman. you, could you yeah. train me now? So say Athena was my boss and I was trying to get a pay rise out of her. Could yeah. you train me to have a negotiation with Athena? You've got to know what you're worth. Mm. So you have to do your research, just like I have to do my research about what going rates are. Okay, so Mike is on... £30,000 a year and I know that and he's my I'm making this up obviously but this is a scenario I know happens to a lot of women and I've spoken to women Mike's on thirty grand a year I'm on 28 but I've been here longer and I'm better than Mike how can you prove that? I can show the deals that I've brought in, that's the deals good. that I've done. But well, that's what you should do. So first advice would be pick your moment. This is not a sort of around the, uh, the water fountain type conversation. Mm-hmm. So pick your moment. Pick your moment that suits you. Okay. Do I make an appointment? Yep. Make okay. an appointment. Thursday, by the way. Thursday's the best day to ask for a pay rise. <gasps> I'm writing that down. This is worth it just for this. <laughs> Thursday. Why Thursday? I don't know. But statistically, Thursday's the best day. 
Guys, mm. this is on lockdown now. So Thursday, so I make my point with Athena for the you Thursday. You make the appointment, you get your evidence, you check around with local recruiters to see if you've got better than the going rates because you may be onto a good thing and you don't know it. Okay. I would probably ask for a little tiny bit more than you really want, so there's a little bit of wriggle room for some flexibility. And that would be Isn't it just way. fair, though, that if Mike gets it, I should get it? No, life's not fair. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm writing that down. Life's not fair. <laughs> Josie Irwin has been Head of Employment Relations for the Royal College of Nursing since 2004 and is the RCN's lead negotiator. So wherever the RCN goes, Josie is out the front. <laughs> Helen Ormrod works in a busy paediatric accident and emergency department in London. Please welcome Helen. And Charlotte Mead is a community staff nurse who provides home nursing care to housebound patients in the borough of Newham. Please welcome Charlotte. All right, so this is the meat and potatoes now. I guess what we want to ask you guys is what can we do to help nurses? What's the current situation? We should probably go to you, Josie. What's the current situation for nurses at the moment? Where do you stand financially? Where are the negotiations with the government? What are the government trying to take away? What would you like them to give you? Nurses have lost 14% between their salaries and the rate of inflation since the coalition government came in and then the Tories in 2010. For average nurses' salaries, that means that most nurses have lost £3,000 a year at least. Some have lost more. And that means that nurses up and down the country, across Scotland, England, Northern Ireland and Wales, basically are struggling to survive. Inflation is currently running at 3.7%. 3.7%. Yet the government say that 1% is enough for public sector staff and nurses in particular, the Chancellor, Mr Hammond, denies that there is... Exactly. Denies that there is a problem. Well, he would, wouldn't he, given that he has two houses and is a millionaire. So he doesn't understand. So I think the stories that have been told this evening, the stories, Deborah, that you've just told, your experience of shadowing a nurse today, and Felicity's tale of the nurse who stayed to do the extra Mm. work after they had already completed a 12-hour shift. That's everyday lived experience for every nurse up and down the country. And the government don't understand that every nurse up and down the country, our information is absolutely clear that this is the case, works at least one shift a week on top of their contracted hours. And that's at least six hours six plus hours, often unpaid, usually unpaid. And that's the kind of thing that we need to get out and across. And you're doing fantastically in helping us explain that because that's exploitation. It's nothing short of exploitation of nurses' goodwill. And that nurses' goodwill will run out at some point because they're exhausted. And just one final point, because otherwise I will go on and on and on and on. Oh, you do, um, you'll be like us then. The, <laughs> indeed. Um, I'm a negotiator. Um, <laughs> uh, the story, Deborah, that you told about the need that nurses have to deliver good quality patient care. Every other year, the Royal College of Nursing does a survey, and we always ask a question about, can you deliver the kind of quality of care that you would want to? And that's been going up and up and up. And in the last survey we did, 59%, 59% of those nurses that we surveyed said they were unable to deliver the kind of quality of care that they would want to have themselves. And the impact on nurses, and we're going to hear from, I won't steal their show, um, from them in a moment, is that they feel compromised and dirty And it's soul-destroying because they're not able to deliver the kind of quality of care that we all want for ourselves and for those that we love. And 
it's those stories that we need to be telling. And I'm so pleased that we're able to get those stories out this evening. <laughs> What is astounding is that, and look, this is going to start out as an insult, not to nurses, but the Brits in general, is that when you go into a retail store, for example, I can see how hard managers have to work to instill a culture of caring, to instill a culture of giving a shit. Like, that is not something natural that comes to people. In retail, for example, over here, there's not a culture of it. And here you have people that want to give the best care that is available. They want to be so good at their job. You want to do everything you can. You want to go above and beyond. You know that you can do something that other people can't and you're excited about it. And somehow, now, they're the people being penalised and then, sorry, and I am an ex-hospitality worker so I don't say this to be disparaging but often you've got top-down management trying to encourage people below them to do better and in this sector you've got people at the ground level saying please let, let us, us do, do a better job. job. Yeah. Like, not even let me live a better life, but pay me enough so I can live. Not thrive, just live, just survive so I can do a better job. Like, people are putting their job before their life and we're penalising them I for know. it. It's, it's astounding. And as a service we're all going to need, what is it like day-to-day? -day? Let's go to some actual nurses. I don't know, I've got some good opinions. Here, Charlotte... <laughs> That all of them are stellar. Thank you. But Charlotte and Helen, your nurses day in, day out. Helen, you are a paediatric nurse. Charlotte, you go into people's houses where they're not in hospital, but you actually go into the house and you look after them in their own home. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like and how it's changed under the coalition and the Conservative government yeah. and what you would like it to be like? So, I'm um, Charlotte. One in nine nursing posts is vacant at the moment. So that's what it feels like. Mm. If you've got a team of eight people, you should have one more person, you know. Um, so a ninth of your work needs to be done as extra. And in those, of those positions, mental health and community services are the ones that are being hit the hardest. Um, and I know Felicity has spoken about her experiences with mental health services in this country in the past. They can be amazing, but only when they're fully staffed. And yes. it's the same with where I work in the community. I would love to be able to spend a good hour with my patients, but I can't because I've got How 10 people How do you get with them? As long as it takes for me to do what I need to do. But like you were talking about with Tasha earlier and providing a good death, one of the main things in my job is looking after people who have made that decision that I'm terminally ill, so I'm going to go home and die. Mm. And that's a really big part of a good death. I want to be able to spend an hour and a half if I need to sit with my patient who is dying of X, Y and Z and talk to their family and give them the highest quality, person-centred, holistic care that I can. But some days I've got to do my job and get out because I've got... 10 more people to see down the line and it's 12 o'clock already, you know? Mm. You feel it on the front line and you feel it when you go home and you lie in bed and stare at the ceiling and go, oh, I wish I'd done that or, oh, I forgot to chart that or, oh, I can still hear the machines bleeping <laughs> in my head as I'm staring at the ceiling. And it's heartbreaking because I love this profession mm. and I teach my students in the community when they come to me from university and occasionally they'll say to me Charlie financially am I going to be okay mm. when I qualify mm. and it's getting to the point where I can't answer them honestly because if I answer them honestly I'm going to say I've just moved out of London to Essex because I can't afford a two-bedroom place if I want to raise a family with my fiancé in London. So we're out to Essex, and even so, we're still renting because we're never going to be able to buy. Mm. And I'm seeing my friends leave mm. in droves because this is the best profession in the world. Like, I wouldn't do anything else because I love it so yeah. much. Yeah, that's what I wanted to come across, that, like, 
we legit have the best jobs. Oh my God, yeah. Like we have, <laughs> like the best jobs. I spend the majority of my day like blowing bubbles and <laughs> um, chatting to babies and getting to make children better. Like I've got such a privilege. Like yeah. I just, I really want that to come across that it's such a privilege, <laughs> but... The problem is, is that they're making the privilege harder and harder yeah, yeah, to feel yeah. like a privilege. When you don't get to care for the kids as much as you want to, it stops feeling that mm. amazing. Like in A&E, we have been through four major incidents within five months. And to then be given a pat on the head to say, oh, you know, like, thanks. And then being told that there's no magic money tree and then one billion going to the DUP. Oh. It feels oh. incredibly patronising. Do you know what's <laughs> sick to me? That the government are very happy to have your services for you to do, you know, the job of an oily rag and then they have the audacity to come and take photos with you after these incidences. Oh like, I think it's really sick. And I just think if you are depriving people of a basic living, of being able to live, but you want a photo opportunity, quite frankly, you can get fucked. (laughs) Can I just ask what a nurse is likely to earn and what a nurse was earning 10 years ago? Do you know the figures on that? It hasn't gone up very much. Um, An average nurse's salary is about 26,000. But that is taking every nurse across the country. So it's those that are paid right at the top and right down the bottom. But who can live on 26,000 pounds in London or actually any major city around the country? And just by way of contrast, because we were talking about the retail industry, Aldi, that German supermarket company, is paying £32,000 for new graduates and giving them a car. And by contrast, newly qualified nurses earn from April this year just over £22,000. So over the last 10 years, a nurse's salary has probably gone up about a thousand quid overall. Um, I mean, it's pathetically small, pathetically small. One of the things they were saying today that they were cutting was training budgets. So, um, well, you don't need to train nurses. They just sort of like get it. They'll pick it up. They'll pick it up. Tasha Tasha was saying she teaches and she loves teaching. It's a teaching hospital where she works. Mm. And she said there's so little budget now to train new nurses. So they want to learn a new skill and they want to be able to go and work in, you know, cardio or pediatrics or I don't know what the term are, but they need to learn... Cardio's an exercise. Cardiac is about... (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Thank you. I was just letting her get away with it. I'd already corrected her once. They want to learn Zumba. (laughs) They want to learn, you know, just basic Zumba techniques that could save a life, guys. I mean, exercise is important too, Charlie. Actually, ever. And Theresa May is like, oh, we don't have enough money to have a professional Zumba coach work one-on-one with each nurse. While she's running in While wheat she's, fields. Oh, she's, she's running in wheat fields. I mean, what is that? Um, no, seriously. Uh, there are all sorts of bronchiolitis courses mm-hmm. that people want to go on. Yeah, and they're not, there's just There's not the training budget yeah. there for yeah. them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a real pipeline issue. One of the nurses today was saying loads of her friends, they trained with her, but yeah. they just couldn't go into it because they could see there wasn't the money or they tried it and the hours were so difficult because yeah. they were working That's shifts not- for free and they ended up going elsewhere. And I said, what are they doing? And she said they left the NHS. They've gone to do other things. They've yeah. gone to work for consultancies. Yeah. They've gone to do other things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one of the trainee nurses, who was amazing, she was lovely, her name's Azia, she said, I am the first generation in my family to go to college, mm-hmm. to get a degree. My parents are so proud of me. And I said, will you stay? She said, I will because I really love it. Mm. But she said, you have to really love it. It's very hard. It's very, very intense. I would have left by now if I didn't absolutely want to do it. Mm. So it's now a profession, only those superhuman beings with a real vocation for cleaning others. You know, you have to have an extra bit in you, I think. And the readiness of a Wimbledon ball boy. (laughs) Yes. Like just ready yeah. to go at all times. Yeah. It's a lot of what skills. What do you need? Bam. There's a towel. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of skills to want someone to have. So regular people who think, yeah, nursing might be for me, go into it and go, oh, no, I can't cope with this. Can you elaborate what, on that? What happens is as 
the government are bringing back tuition fees for student nurses mm -hmm. as they cut the bursary, which, by the way, is the only thing that kept me going while I was in university. Could you as, just explain the bursary if people are listening? Uh, don't know. So not anymore, but as, if you're a student nurse, you used to get a bursary, which is a little bit of money every month just to help you through, because it's an understanding that as you're a student nurse, you work shifts on the wards with other nurses as you train and also that your academic year is a lot longer than a normal university yeah. academic year you basically work september september so the bursary is me well was means tested and it used to be a little bit of money every month so i used to get 440 pounds a month my rent in london was 420 and that is what i lived off as a student nurse so i came out with debt Woo! <laughs> what this is meaning is that there are people who really, really want to go into nursing who now can't. The mature student numbers just completely yeah. slashed. It would be interesting to see what happens to nurses who come of a poorer background. Yeah. Nurses who are the first in their families to go to university. I mean, my dad, who is in the audience, was a probation officer for 30 plus years. He was on a public sector salary. Dad couldn't have bankrolled me through university, but we might be looking at a point where the only nurses you get are the ones who can be bankrolled through university. Mm. And that's a real shame for those, especially those who retrain in later life, mm. those with kids, those with a real passion who get to their late 20s, 30s, 40s and say, do you know what I want to do? I want to dedicate the rest of my life to other people because I have lived experience that I think can be a great part of this job. And that's just not an option anymore. Yeah. Why are we penalising these people? <laughs> We've I actually don't know. seen You'd applications fall by a quarter yeah. for nursing degrees in this year. So this since, year? Yeah, so yeah. since they've introduced not doing the bursaries and having to pay tuition fees, so nursing students are having to juggle a lot, plus with an overwhelming amount of debt that they come out with, it will drop by a quarter, which is... Mm. So what's our pipeline going to look like? We're not going to yeah, have enough nurses. and pipeline. Well, yeah. we did have a lot of nurses come from abroad, but now with Brexit, what's going to happen there? No, nope. no, it's yeah. not happening. So the recent numbers are that there are more nurses leaving than there are nurses coming in. Mm. There's a huge chunk of nurses who are due to retire in the One next... One in three. One in three are due to retire in the next 10 years. What um, are we going to do, though? What are we going to do? Like, seriously, what can we do about this? Okay, guys, I think that I might be quite good at nursing. Um, <laughs> I've never tried it, but I might be a genius. <laughs> sure, sure. I think Molly had the answer, I really do. Molly said in her poem, nurses roar. What every nurse has to do is speak out and be bold. My view is that, in answer to Deborah's question, why is this happening, some of it, with apologies to the guys in the audience, is about the fact that nursing is perceived as women's work. In any other sector, if you work in IT, if there were 40,000 vacancies, supply and demand, I did economics at university, and I know that if supply is short and demand goes up, then you pay people a bit more for what you've got, but they don't do it to nursing. Why? And I think it has something to do with... A, it's a largely female profession. Did you say 90% um, earlier? 90% of nurses are female. But nurses owe it to themselves not mm. to continue to put up with the working the extra shift without saying something about it. And I go with Molly, raw. And now, in the run-up to the budget in the autumn, is the time that you've got to be bold and to shout and to get your voices heard. And that will help me, as your negotiator, to get that deal. And I can't do it without something behind me. So nurses roar, nurses go. <laughs> This is Deborah Francis White from The Guilty Feminist. In the original recording of this episode, I made some comments about a personal experience I had had hours before that had shocked me and a conversation I had had with an underfunded inner city NHS hospital psychiatrist. I was making an argument which I explained was specifically designed to appeal to certain right-wing policymakers and their supporters who do not wish to fund the NHS. Though well-intentioned, it clearly sounded to some listeners like I was scaremongering and stigmatizing those with mental health issues who are in fact more likely to be victims than perpetrators of violence. 
I do apologise for this because the last thing I want to do is contribute to the marginalisation of those with mental health issues. Please accept my apology. We make an episode every week and are likely to screw up sometimes, but we'll continue to tackle big subjects boldly, listen to feedback, learn, change and move on. Thank you. Who would like to ask a question? Oh, shivers. It was just to ask Deborah's question again. What do non-nurses do? Yes, what do non-nurses do? Thank you. Thank you for asking Josie? my question again. What do we do? Who do we contact? How do we say it? Sign up to the RCN campaign. Details on our website. Contact your MP. There's details again on the website. And that's the Royal College of Nursing. The Royal College of Nursing. Scrap the cap campaign. Just Google it. What does scrap the cap mean? Get rid of the 1%. Right, okay. Raise it and pay nurses what they're entitled to. I mean, in in every sense of the word, get rid of the 1%. Get rid of it. it. (laughs) Scrap the cap. Okay, so what's the website? www.rcn.org.uk. rcn.org.uk. Sign up to the campaign. Write to your MP, ask them to scrap the cap. And there's a handy postcard that helps you do that on the site. So just get one of those postcards, send it to your MP, and tell them to do their job properly. And when Parliament comes back on the 6th of September, join us in our rally outside Parliament while MPs are going to Prime Minister's Question Time on the 6th of September. We'll be there 12 to 2 big rally in Parliament Square. Come and join that too. 6th of September. 6th of September. Okay, so 6th of September, the Guilty Feminist will be there. We will have a big sign that says, unexplained public laughter disrupts the patriarchy, so you'll be able to find us. Um, (laughs) We will put on Twitter where we'll be meeting. If you would like to come and march with the Guilty Feminist for the nurses, please come and do it, because we've got to. We've just got to. And honestly, if you've ever thought about protesting, if you've ever thought about activism, but you've been like, I don't know what I can contribute, or I don't know if it's for me, or maybe I'll be a bit busy that day I cannot tell you the joy of being engaged in your community if you are listening and you've never been to a protest or you've never been to a rally nurses affect you how they live affects the way you live they're all important issues but this one affects every single person in the community and it would be a great show if you're able to get down there please do get down there on the 6th of September and don't just make an idle gesture that you go oh yeah I'll send a postcard get on the website get the postcard and send it to your MP because as we've seen with Brexit votes matter they have an effect government works so if you start affecting your government they will have to listen let's not give them a reason or give them any excuse to ignore us Uh, any other questions do we have any other questions one down the front from Molly it's not a question it's a poem Thank you so much, everybody. I think if you're a lazy kind of person, which I am, I'm very sedentary, I'm Jewish, I don't do exercise, I just chill on my (laughs) bum. I don't do exercise. I think just making it a dialogue, an open dialogue, a rhetoric, telling stories like you just did yourself about how, not even how great we are, just stories about nursing and about how vital healthcare is, especially the NHS is to us, Um, just as we're trying to dismantle the patriarchy through bringing up our boys better by saying stop cussing our girls from the get-go. Mm. Same with nurses, just make it a rhetoric that, you know, we're doing good stuff. That's what we're trying to do, yeah. is good yeah. stuff. And just make it an everyday dialogue. Yeah. You know, if you're feeling more click-happy, just, you know, make it an open dialogue on a rhetoric that needs to be shared on a social kind of platform. So. And hashtag, if that's all you can do, if you're at home, we don't want to be ableist about this, especially since it's about healthcare. Mm-hmm. If you're at home and what you can do is hashtag activism, it does work. I've cut out eating meat because I've tried to avoid seeing things about animal rights and failed. Um, I've kept looking away, but it's been enough stuff come up. And you can affect change. Use your voice in whatever way that you can. Can I just ask you guys, is there anything else you would like to say? Charlotte? There's two things that I want to say. The first is, it wasn't until I started having this open dialogue with people that I realised that people didn't know that we'd taken a 14% pay cut. Because my own little echo chamber, I thought everybody knew this. I thought this was common knowledge. So go out and tell your family, tell your friends, talk to your nurses, talk to the girls in A&E, talk to the girls... I haven't said it outside having a cheeky fag break, you know? Um, 
do as we say, not as we do. Um, <laughs> that is what the NHS Absolutely. is run on. <laughs> <laughs> and say thank you to your nurses, your doctors, your healthcare assistants. God bless our healthcare assistants. Mm. Um, your physiotherapists, your OTs, love them all. Mm. And the second thing I want to say is thank you to Deborah. Mm. So yeah. I wouldn't mm. have met Helen. I wouldn't have met Tasha. Um, and I wouldn't have met Hannah, who's in the audience tonight as well. We love you. <laughs> if it wasn't for your leadership day, mm. you put out a very brief call out in, I think, the sexuality episode about this leadership day. And you said, I'm going to do the £10 places because I want nurses to be there about negotiation. Mm. And you started this whole snowball, mm. this whole platform for our voices. I've made amazing new friends, friends I didn't even know that I had. And now I'm sat here talking at the RCN about something that I'm incredibly passionate about. And I'm so grateful. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Let's, uh, I'm... Honestly, I, I really, in <laughs> contrast to what you do, I feel I deserve no, like, negative applause, like 10%. I get applauded every time I go to work. And I could probably get applauded in life about 50% less. Felicity, probably 75% less. <laughs> she gets more applause than me. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, that is not how that came out. Uh, <laughs> and I think you guys need to be applauded more. I'm so grateful you came on the Leadership Day. Um, I did put a call out because I knew that if I said Leadership Day, that I'd get a lot of people in the corporate world coming on it. We had two price bands. We had £195 for women who could afford it. And we wanted to have as many £10 places as possible. Because I thought, for some people, £195 is very little. And for some people, £20 is a lot. And I just thought, who's not going to come? Who's going to think this isn't for them? And the people I wanted more than anybody were nurses. And so I just put a call out. And I did it on the sexuality episode with Phoebe Waller-Bridge deliberately because I knew that would be the most listened to episode of all time. I mean, <laughs> and it is... I was also there. This is... <laughs> This is, this is feeling quite pointed now, actually, Hurtful. Deb. Um, Hurtful. Hurtful. But you've been on lots of episodes, and Phoebe's only been on two. And so... <laughs> that's... No, that's... Oh, God. She's too... She's I so can make anything about me. Seriously. Let me... Really, the place I want to get to is we have... Because the thing is, I have to pay to have nice rooms. I have to pay the other teachers for the breakout sessions well, or it's not feminism. It costs so much to do all that just to break even. The only way to do it was just to start doing it, but we'd really like to get to that place where we can put on affordable events and allow some people to come for free or nearly nothing. Thank you so, so much. Now, just quickly, could I ask Helen, what would you like to say? I think I would like to say that this is an ongoing thing. So even though if you feel really rallied tonight, nurses need your backs up until September and beyond. So please, please, please keep motivated and keep looking at it and just maybe think about your nursing friends once in a while as well we we do a hard job and we don't talk about it a lot to other people and I read in the newspaper today that they were calling frontline nurses shock absorbers and I think that's sometimes how we feel so if you do know a nurse just maybe make them a cup of tea Mm. <laughs> is there any way we can or a gin and tonic I love gin and tonic <laughs> <laughs> I've if, never met a nurse that doesn't like a gin and tonic <laughs> that's funny after the event they were yeah. all were drinking gin and tonic <laughs> yeah. if people want to donate to nurses who are going to food banks is there any way that they can go the RCN has a hardship fund so for details again contact the RCN great I read before this I'm pretty sure in some of the literature that 52% of the grants that they give out are to cover living expenses? Yeah. Most of the grants that are given out are to cover living expenses. It's about nurses who, for financial reasons, get themselves into debt, can't pay their mortgage, and are really in pretty desperate straits. And most and importantly, those grants, most of those grants, go to people in full-time work. Yeah. Mm. It's terrifying. All right, so I've got to do... And there are buckets out there. Please give generously. The reason they did tickets for free tonight was I think we got the room... Uh, but tickets for the Guilty Feminists are normally 15 quid. So if you could put at least £10 in the bucket, that will all go straight to the nurses. So what we've done is we've subverted the whole room situation. We're not being paid. No one here is being paid. What? So, <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, um, they tell me at the end. <laughs> so if you could please put 10 or 15 quid in the bucket. If you can put more, lovely. But if you can't... If you haven't brought that, 
then just go on the website and do it through the hardship fund. But it'd be great if you have got something in your purse now to put in there. That would be really nice because otherwise you've just come for a free show. It's like you've taken money out of a nurse's wallet. <laughs> Follow The Guilty Feminist on Twitter at Guilt Fem Pod. Check out our Instagram, which is Instagram.com forward slash The Guilty Feminist. Like our Facebook page for the people over 30. Sign up to our mailing list to get notified as soon as a new episode is released. And please go to iTunes and rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps other people to find our podcast. And give it five, five stars. stars. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host, Felicity Ward. And our very special guests, Molly Case, Josie Irwin, Charlotte Mead and Helen Orbrod. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Selinski for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Hannah and Alice and everyone at the RCN as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Oh, do you know what? It's like, no, I don't mind at all. Send me on Facebook now. That could be the photo now. Um, no, it's not. It's not. Um, it's actually... <laughs> what? I mean, it's so funny this has happened during the podcast. What? That's not real. I've no, just who have a, you... I've just got a text from John Hamm. <laughs> <laughs> That's someone it that is, you've called John Hamm, it's, please. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the real John Hamm. Uh. It's... Okay, Can a you imagine? Mine, a friend of mine who's doing a movie that I wrote. Don't go on about it. No need. Um, don't know why you brought it up, guys. He, yeah, for some reason there was an in-joke ages ago and he ended up being called John Hamm in my phone and I've never changed it back. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Because I just love it. that It surprises me every time it happens. Every time it happens, I just go, oh, I got a text from John Hamm. Okay, clearly not the actual John Hamm. I will never change it back. Because he's the kind of friend that I'll, He'll text me like every couple of months, so it's, it's never worn off. <laughs> that whenever I see it, I believe that to be real. I'll tell you the day I'll change it, when I got the real John Hamm's number <laughs> in my phone. I mean, that day happens, I am tweeting it to all of you. That's when I you am... shut the podcast down, isn't it? Isn't that the end game of this podcast? Oh, no. <laughs> like, that's the ultimate guilty feminist. I'm just no. doing this podcast about to get... feminism <laughs> to get the phone number of a dude, and then we shut it down. <laughs> We will not be shutting it down. He will be guesting every week. <laughs> hey! Guesting. You're still the co-host. Okay. What? Do when um, I'm a feminist bot. I will, but also, you know that in this many millennial audience, they're all sitting there going, I'll put my phone on aeroplane mode. I thought you were... <gasps> yes. Oh, yes. Oh, good I point. I know, mate. I know. I could feel it. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, ha, ha, ha. But also... <laughs> good point. Good point. Good point. I forgot to do it myself. I forgot I don't to count, do myself. Because I'm the host. My technology doesn't affect the recording. <laughs> okay, okay. It was an error, guys. It was an error. I apologise to all millennials forever. <laughs> do it, I'm a feminist.